Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Get out your King James Bible for English-speaking people. And uh, please follow along. This is going to be a, a, a little bit of a long intro. And then the videos afterwards, the different parts of the videos are going to be a little bit shorter. Maybe. It's up to the Lord. Uh, one thing I've noticed lately, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that brethren aren't really getting into um, Bible studies anymore. They prefer more, what I'm seeing with some of the ministries, they're going from preaching the Word, like the Bible says, preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. Instead of preaching the Word, they get into what's going on in the world, and they start gossiping, and, to, and you know, drama, and they might use some scriptures every now and then, but they get into, this is how I feel, this is, they're a talk show. They've turned, them, they've turned the ministry into a talk show. They're a talk show. They're no longer preaching the word, being instant in season, out of season. They're more of, this is how I feel, this is what I think, and this is my opinion. And everyone starts asking them their opinion and what they think, and what they, instead of saying, what does the word of God say? Thus saith the Lord. People are, not, are kind of straying from what the word of God says. So God put this on my heart to do this quick study, and I know I might upset some of you. It's not my intention to upset anybody. My intention is to show the truth. And if the truth upsets to get you back on the right path, then that's the, my whole hope. Brother says Christ, that's my whole hope. So is this, we're starting this one because are you a Bible believer? Oh, of course I am. Oh, of course I am. I, I, I'm going to be in here too. Okay, I'm going to be kicking myself. I'm going to be kicking the brethren. And I'm going to be kicking a lot of men in ministry. And... I want to warn you, be careful. The first thing that they always say is when you kick someone's sin, when you kick someone's wickedness, they always just jump straight to, oh, they're attacking me personally. How many of you have had that? When you say, hey, this is what the Word of God says, and you don't quite line up with the Word of God. How many of you have had someone say, you're just attacking me personally? They take it personal. They don't take the correction to heart. They don't take God's Word, put it in their heart. They take it personally, and they start going off. Okay, a good example of that is when I, I can I can imagine when Paul, when he was talking to some of the married men, telling them and correcting them and saying, "Hey, be careful that you don't try to please your wife over pleasing God." I bet you some of them said, "Oh, he's just personally attacking me." No, he's correcting you. God comes first. There's nothing wrong with pleasing your wife as long as it doesn't go against the Word of God and doesn't go against God. And that God comes first. Jesus comes first. And the wives, you can please your husbands as long as it doesn't usurp the Word of God. In other words, in order to please your husband or wife, you have to displease God. That's when you're wrong. But I can see Paul telling them, hey, this is wrong and you need to make sure you're doing this. And they're like, oh, he just personally attacked me. He's attacking me through my wife. Or he's attacking me through my husband. He's just atta personally attacking me. So, please. Okay. We are going to call out Peter Ruckman a little bit. But I remember Peter Ruckman used to say, thin skin. There's, everyone's just so thin skin. No, it's just everyone is trying to use anything and everything as an excuse not to listen to correction. Not to take rebuke. Not to be reproved. They don't want it. They don't like to be corrected. They don't like it. If someone corrects me, I'll be honest with you. When I first get corrected, I'm like, I'm scared. Did I say something wrong? Did I say something wrong? And then there's sometimes where something like I slipped up and said a wrong word once, or skipped a word, or said two words back to back and left out a word on accident. I didn't do it purposely, and they called me out big time. It's like then there's some people who love to correct just to correct, and those are the people I don't like. I don't like people who love to correct just to correct because they like to have that power of correction to correct people. But people who are sincere and honest and they do it with love, I love correction because I want to be lined up with the book. I don't want to make mistakes and be a false representative of Jesus Christ and His perfect written word, the King James Bible. So one thing we talked about in another message was, is that, or another study was, is it the message that matters or the words of God that matters? Because another thing you'll get from people is, as well, when, when you call out mistakes of their lowercase g gods, the Bible calls it respecter of persons. The person they follow, they, they, they fall into the trap of worshiping that man. So that's another thing Paul says, respecter of persons. Oh no, he's trying to attack that man. 
I gotta follow my guy that I follow, and he's attacking, he's, he's personally attacking me through that man. No. Paul warns, be careful. God's not a respecter of Paul said, uh, Peter says God's not a respecter of persons. Paul says God's not a respecter of persons. Through the Old Testament, God's not a respecter of persons. Okay? But you'll see some people, they'll, they'll call them out, and they'll be like, i got to follow them, i got to follow them. No, no, you're supposed to be following this. And they take it as a personal attack. And you know one of the uh, justification they give to defend the man that they're following? Well, it's, it's the message that matters. You miss the point of the message. Right? I had a brother in Christ correct me, and I said, okay, you know what, you're 100% right. You're 100% right. I, I said something wrong, I slipped up, I, I took a word over here that I saw, and I was reading, and I was looking ahead, trying to think, okay, what am I going to say next? And I said both words at the same time, and I left out a word. Because I took the word here, copied and pasted it here in my head, so I was trying to look ahead. And I messed up the passage a little bit. Okay? And he corrected me, I said, yes, you're 100% right, I said it wrong. And one thing I put in there is I did say, hey, I hope this mess mistake didn't mess up the point I was trying to get across. And he said, no, no, it didn't, no, it didn't. Okay, good, good, good. Because the words matter. The words and the point matter. And the point is based, the message is based off what the words actually say. And if you start messing with the words, you start messing with the message. Think about that. You start messing with the words, you start messing with the message. And we're going to, we're going to go through this whole series and show that the message got messed up because we messed up the words. Whether you were taught that wrongly, or you hardened your heart, uh, the Bible says, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, having their conscience, still part of the heart, conscience seared with a hot iron. They're so hard-hearted that they won't listen. They won't listen. So, get your King James Bibles out. We're going to go through some verses, but mainly this is a talk, an intro, to get into the main Bible studies we're going to be doing, the series that's going to go along with this. Okay? Is it the message that matters or the Word of God that matters? First, let's see what the Bible says about changing God's Word and what God thinks of the Word. I could use tons of verses. I just threw a few of them in here real quick. Psalms 12, 6. Turn to Psalms 12, 6. Psalms 12:6. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. And I've talked about this before. If you've ever watched the videos that I have uh, linked under the Christian movies, it's called uh, Tears Among the Wheat. We have that series of videos. There's three of them. They're like two to three hours each. It's long. It takes time to go through. I make sure to go through them once a year minimum because I want to be reminded how we got the Bible today, why, what the cost was, what people had to go through. Okay. But one thing that talks about in there is it talks about when God said, okay, the Greek is no longer the world language. Very few people can read Greek. Very few people can read Latin, but it was never done in Latin. The New Testament was never done in Latin. It was done in Greek. I watched that video, and I, I encourage you to watch it, Brothers and Sisters Christ, where it goes through, and it shows if someone revised, it could be revised a hundred times, but if it's still the same Bible, even though they've changed it, I don't count that. What I counted was every time it became a new Bible, they changed the name, it's something new, and they had to change, it got to the point where they had to change the name. There were seven Bibles, and the seventh Bible was the King James Bible. Okay, you have the Geneva Bible before it. Then you had some other Bibles. Some only had the New Testament. Um, I have some of them over there. But you count them, I counted them all up, and, even, and they said, well, this one was revised ten times. I don't count that as ten Bibles, even though it is when they change it a lot. But when it, you watch it, when it got to the seventh Bible, it's like the King James Bible, it was done. It is finished. That's what this is talking about, that God's Word is pure words. Are we treating and handling God's Word as pure words? Are we treating them like they're just like man's words? Are we handling... Brother, there's a difference. There's a difference. Are we handling it 
like it's God's word, pure, perfect? Or are we handling it like it's God, a man's words? Nah, we can change it. We can add to it. We can subtract from it. We can correct it. We can improve on it. Turn to Psalms 119.105. Turn to Psalms 119.105. This is King David. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Brother says Christ, are we treating and handling the word like it's what guides us, it's, what lead, it's our foundation of how we live, how we talk, how we live, how we give praise to God, how we honor God, how we do good works that line up. That's why I always say, well, I always say it, are, we doing, are you doing good works that line up with Scripture? Or are you doing good works that line up with man? God or man? God or man? That's what it's always going to come down to, brothers and sisters Christ, as we talk this. God's way, man's way. God's words, man's words. God's truth, man's truth. I always have to do that because man's truth, always the world's truth, and mankind tends to go against God's truth. There's absolute truth, and then there's man's truth. What you want to believe. What is absolutely true? You have to believe the truth because you're into absolute truth. Or you just want to believe any truth. Remember Pontius Pilate. What is truth? What is truth? Okay. Psalms 119.11. Go back to Psalms 119. We're in that. It's the longest psalm. 119.11. Oops. I went too far back. Psalms 119, verse 11. Actually, back up to 9. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By the opinions of men? By what man thinks? By good morals? Man's words? Man's standards? Here it is. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The perfect written word of God. You can't get around that. Are we lining up with this, brother says Christ? Are we lining up with the world? Today, most of the professing Christians I come across, I don't believe they're saved. I just don't. Their attitude towards this, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word, is they hate a perfect written word. And they take it as like, you know, instru the instruction manual, when you get things, I've done it before, where you buy things, and there's an instruction manual, you take it and you throw it to the side, and you fiddle with it until you figure it out to the point where you can use it. And then years down the road, I pick up the manual and I start reading it. And I'm like, oh, I could do it that. I could do this with it. And I can do that with it. I didn't know about this. I didn't know about... That's the idea I get from... That's what I get from the lost world, these professing Christians. They don't read this. They don't read God's Word. They just listen to some guy preach it. It's a, a Bible, but it's not the King James Bible. But you know, they listen to some guy preach and they don't really know what's actually in the Bible. Not to go too much on a... Rabbit Trail, because it's going to be a long intro as it is, but I've been watching a lot of the cartoons on the Bible stories in the Old Testament, and then I turn around and actually purposely read the story in the King James Bible, and it, their stories, those cartoons are supposed to be for kids, and the movies for adults, all of them go against the Word of God. They can't line up with the Word of God to save their life. They're doing it man's way. I remember watching one that says that this is, we believe this is true to the, the message, the spirit of the message. But we took some liberties to make it more dramatic and, and more of an entertainment. But it, it's true to the spirit. It goes back under that false spirit of, that's the Antichrist spirit, of it's the message that matters, not the words. Not the word of God that matters, it's the message. And when you take God's word away, you can make the message out to be anything you want it to be. Man's truth, not God's absolute truth. Let's keep going. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Brothers and Christ, I've known people, these false Christians, oh, I've searched God. They're, but you ask them, how have you searched for God? With my whole heart have I sought thee. It just talked about according to thy word. It says, with my whole heart I have sought thee. Their idea of seeking God 
as a religious experience. They go to the Babel buildings. They listen to the man do all the work. That He reads the Bible. He does the prayer. He reads the Bible. He studies the Bible. He preaches the Bible. And they just listen to him. But someone who's truly seeking God with all their heart is going to take God's word. We're going to get to the verse 11, but let's keep going here. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Right here. This big push today in, these, in the easy believism is we're not under, under any law whatsoever. Nobody tells us what to do. We're just believing head knowledge. We have the head knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we get to go on and living however we want to live. Nobody tells us what to do. Someone who's truly seeking God evidence is when God commands through his perfect written word, they conform to God's word. They don't take the words out and get a message to make the Bible conform to them. That's what the world, the lost world's doing. They're trying to get the Bible to conform to them. They're trying to get God to conform to them and be okay with how they're living and what they're doing. They don't want to heave to God. We've done those studies, Brother Christ. Is Jesus really your Lord, capital L Lord? Is he really your capital K King? Is he really God manifest in the flesh, in the life that you're living? If he is, you're going to read this book, you're going to hide this book in your heart, and you're going to live it. You're going to obey the commandments. First commandment for today is obey the gospel. Get saved God's way. But people don't want to do that, because they know it means a changed life after salvation. That means God's going to clean up your life so he can use you. We talked about this in a lot of verses. Uh, God knows them that are his. In God's house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. The honor is the gold and silver. The dishonor is the wood and earth. All right? And the next verse, it says, if you get these things, I, I don't have the next verse memorized, but it talked about if you get these things out, talking about sin, that them that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's sin, iniquity. And it says, if you depart from these, you'll be a vessel of gold and silver, meat for the master's use. So God can use you. God doesn't want to save someone and just watch them rot away. He wants to use you after he saves you. And he can only use somebody who's, list, who's hiding God's word in their heart, sanctifying their life, and setting themselves apart from the world. Right? As a good example, I remember I always talked about that as a good example. God can use you as a good example. God can use you as a bad example. But with my whole heart have I sought thee. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart. How do you seek God with all of your heart? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. This is how you seek the Lord with all your heart. And you're going to find out that a lot of times people are not seeking the Lord with all their heart. They're like they, they've been deceived into just like a religious experience, a flesh experience, getting on a flesh high. Emotions. Okay? That's not seeking God. You see it in these battle buildings. Truly seeking God is taking God's word as it is without changing it in any way, shape, or form as it is and hiding it in your heart and living it. That's truly seeking God. It's the words that matter. Not the message. The message is always going to come from the words. So if the words are right, the message will be right. If the words are wrong, if they change the words so they can push whatever message they want, and you see that a lot, they'll tweak, they'll mess with the Word of God so they can get apart the message that they want to give. Okay. I've seen that with a lot of people. They start out with, and I've done it before, where I've told you guys, I've done a study where this is the point I want to get across. This has to be absolute truth. And by the time I got done with the study, I was 100% wrong. Why? Because this told me I was wrong. This is the final authority. Okay? The Word of God is the final authority. But you have some men says, I don't care, I'm going to end up changing the words so I can get the message I want to get to, I want my point, man's point to get across, not God's point. I'm trying to use man's wisdom, and man's wisdom, you know what it always comes down to? Change the book. 
That's what it always comes down to, brothers and sisters. Change the book. Let's keep going. Proverbs 36. This is one we're going to use a lot. Proverbs 36. Go all the way back to Proverbs 36. You're going to hear me say this a lot, maybe, in this study. Because, bottom line, all these, when we, when we do the test, we're going to get to the test. All of us are going to fail the test, and we're going to go through and show that the, re, the real point of changing what God said and, and changing the words to man's words, even though, like, the Trinity, they'll say, this is the Trinity verse that talks about the Father, the Son, and the, and the, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay. We might get to that today, but we might save it for another study. But they'll always say, this is the Trinity verse. No, it's the Godhead verse. It's not the Trinity verse. It's the Godhead. So there's some people that are using the word Trinity, the title Trinity, ignorantly because they're grabbing the Bible saying, this is truth, and it is. But then they add to it by saying Trinity, when it's, no, it's the Godhead. But we're going to find out that there's usually a, Satan's tricky. He's not stupid. There's usually another meaning, a hidden meaning for Trinity. And there was. We've, it's come out to light. A lot of the Bible-believing brethren said, hey, you know what? I'm not going to say Trinity anymore. Praise God. I'm going to say Godhead because that's what the Bible says. And then, But some of them still deny what Trinity really means because the real definition is being hidden and tr the word Trinity is stealing the definition of Godhead and saying, hey, I'm just like Godhead, Trinity, God, it's just that. And they're stealing from it. But it has a different meaning. And when you actually study the meaning, the word Trinity makes God's word out to be a lie, which gets us to this verse, Proverbs 36. Uh, I lost it. I went too far back. Proverbs 36. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Add that not to his word. This study, when we go into each individual video, we're going to go through different words that have been added to God's word, and it seems harmless. It just seems totally harmless. But when we actually do the study, we're going to realize it's meant to take away from God's word. It's meant to change what God actually said and the teaching that God's actually teaching and the, what, the real meaning. Remember, they always say it's just the meaning that matters. Well, it's meant to change the actual meaning of the Bible. Anytime someone says, thus saith the Lord, and they say words that aren't in the Bible, they're trying to change God's word. Add thou not unto his words. And that's what this whole study is going to be about. Lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We're going to find that all these different words and terms and titles and names that people use is meant to try to disprove the Bible. And if you're a Bible believer and you stick to the word, it actually points that out and says, hey, we're going to reprove thee, and that is a lie. That those titles you're using, those descriptions you're using, those words you're using, they're a lie. They're not in the Bible. Right? Revelation 22.18. Revelation 22.18. How many times have you heard this one used? Revelation 22.18. The biggest one we're going to be using is, Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Right? And a lot of brethren, ignorantly or intentionally, we were liars. And if someone who was a Bible believer could come along and show in the scriptures, hey, you're not lining up with the book. You're a liar. You're lying. Like I said, ignorantly. I did it ignorantly. Some of us do it ignorantly. But God will not leave us ignorant. I'm getting ahead of myself. But Revelation 22, 18. Last chapter in the Bible. 22, 18. For I testify... Unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, talking about Revelation. I know there's some brethren out there who say, people think it's just for Revelation. We've got scripture all through, add thou not to his word, that says we're not supposed to add to God's word, period, from, Re from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We're not to add to God's word, period. But when it comes to this passage right here, doctrinally, it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. You're going to have the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, and they're going to be using this book big time to say, hey, this was written, it's going. It's written, it's happening. Look, it said that this would happen, this is happening. And the churches that it's talking about, it'll be a whole nother, we can do a whole nother study, but it talks about how you have right to the tree of life. That's not for us. 
how you, those churches you have um, that you can lose your salvation. It's all about works. Those churches aren't for today. There's a lot of instruction in righteousness. We can learn from those seven churches, but they're not for today. But people will say, hey, you know, it's for today, it's for today. And then you point out how, hey, it talks about having a right the tree of life. Some of these churches, I believe, are in the, uh, day, the time of Jacob's trouble, going into the day of the Lord, and then when Satan's let loose for a little season. And you've got to make it through that whole, all three, they, they try to make it out to be three different time periods, but all these three different dispensations, if you really want to split it up into three minor dispensations, but it's all one dispensation when we get into some of our studies when it talks about the, the kingdom of heaven is often a reference to both the time of Jacob's trouble going into the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ and after the thousand year reign when Satan's let loose for a season. He's let loose for a little while. It's all one, part of the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes the kingdom of heaven when Jesus is preaching he's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Sometimes he's talking about the thousand year reign. Sometimes he's talking about the, when Satan gets let loose for a little while in the end. But the whole point is, is that this is doctrinally for the time of Jacob's trouble. This book. Okay? And it talks about the different dispensations, but this book is for the people going through the time of Jacob's trouble. To show them, hey, God was right. Let's keep reading here. The words of prophecy this book. If any man shall add unto these, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now stop. Is that happening right now? Anybody who always says, oh, that's for today... There are t lots of people out there that are putting out Bible perversions. There's a lot of preachers, I call them the, the preachers, of uh, servants of Satan, okay, ministers that transform into the ministers of righteousness. Remember, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, for no marvel that his ministers shall also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They're going to be judged on their works, not the faith of Jesus Christ. Because they don't have faith. They have head knowledge. Right? But they like to transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness. They're doing that today. Are the plagues that are in this book upon them? No. Can they repent and get saved today? Absolutely. Absolutely. But in that time of Jacob's trouble? That's where this applies. If any man shall, be, shall add unto the thing... These things God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. In other words, you'll lose salvation. You're guaranteed to go to hell. Is that for today? No. Because any of these Bible perversions can get saved. Any of these preachers that have been misled and using Bible perversions, they can get saved. In fact, I know a lot of brethren that got saved. I think 33rd book, you listen to his testimony, and he was using a lot of different Bible perversions before he caught to the King James Bible. God slowly got around, taught him, this is wrong, okay, I'm going to grab this book. That book's wrong. And when he finally came to the King James Bible, that's it. That's God's perfect written word. Is he guaranteed to go to hell because he used Bible perversions that added to and subtracted from God's word in the book of Revelation? No. So this isn't for today. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, I believe it applies. People say, you take the mark and you worship the beast. That's one way to lose salvation. You know another way to lose? Or you can't lose it. We've, we've learned this. Forgive me. I've got to correct my words. You have to endure to the end to be saved. And the things you can have to make it to the end is, is you have to make, make it to your death, because people are going to be beheaded in the time of Jacob's trouble. But one of the things you have to avoid doing is taking the mark and worshiping the beast. Another thing you've got to avoid doing is adding to God's Word and subtracting from God's Word when it comes to the book of Revelation. Trying to deceive people. Oh, we're not really going through the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, we can go through the time of Jacob's trouble, but, but you're sealed. Remember, you're sealed. That's not for the time of Jacob's trouble. But they're deceiving people. They're adding to this book and subtracting from this book. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, for instruction righteousness, that's how serious it is to add to God's Word. In that time period, you add to God's Word, you failed. It's all about works and faith. They both go hand in hand. That's why in James it says, uh, faith without works is being dead alone. It's not faith, just faith in the time of Jacob's trouble. 
And true faith, true faith, is backed by good works that line up with the Bible. Fruit. The Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. Those who truly got saved, true faith is backed by good works that line up with the Bible. But I want to throw that last verse in there just to say, hey, you know, be careful. It's good to use that for instruction righteousness to say, this is how serious God takes adding to his word and subtracting from his word. Today, we're under uh, what's called the time of the Gentiles, where salvation's gone out into the world, and anybody can get saved as long as you're breathing. Remember what Jesus said, I didn't come to, to seek and destroy, but to save that which is lost. Today, it's about getting saved. And that time of Jacob's trouble, it's about enduring. It's about enduring to the end. We don't have to endure to the end to get saved. And then shall you be saved. Today, we get saved the moment we come to God broken. Remember, repentance. Repentance. Sor godly sorrow that worketh repentance to salvation. Having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins and the cost of sin. You're going to hell and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You have to have true sorrow in your heart for sinning against God. That's true biblical repentance. Don't let anybody lie to you about it. Oh, repentance going from unbelief to belief. Once again, it's not the words of God that matter. It's just the message. And that's how they're able to deceive people when they change the words of God into a lie. You repent. You believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's down here. It's not just head knowledge. You're not just trying to be part of a Babel building or a club or trying to satisfy family and friends that keep hounding you, it's down here. And it only becomes down here if you repent, because sorrow starts down here. Sorrow is what leads to true belief in the heart. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Then with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Anybody that takes prayer out of salvation, you confess both your repentance and your belief in prayer, and then you ask God to save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's way. But today you have men... I believe servants of Satan that are trying to take away God's way of salvation because they're not saved and they don't want anybody else to get truly saved. They're servants of Satan. They don't want anybody to get saved. They don't want to change their life. They're not sorry for their sins. They love their sins. They use good morals. They try to use good morals. But once again, is it about good morals or is it about what the Word of God says? What man says is right and wrong or what God says is right and wrong? That's all morals are, is what man's kind says is right and wrong. This is what God says is right and wrong, the King James Bible. Okay. I wanted to read some scripture because I almost didn't want to leave scripture out of this completely. But, brothers says Christ, the Bible is very clear. We're not to add to it, we're not to subtract from it. And this is what we're, is our foundation. This is our standard. This is what we hide in our heart and we live. But brothers, says Christ, Satan is always infiltrating. He's always trying to sneak in and destroy anything that's good. He's trying to destroy this. How does he try to destroy it? He puts out tons of Bible perversions. He, has, he puts out, and we're going to get into it a little bit, he's going to put out the, he put out the disease of yea hath God said among the Bible believers. And we're going to do a test to see if you have that disease of yea hath God said. But before we get into it, there's a couple things I want to talk about. In 1979, they came out with the philosophy. Remember saying this? It's in the tares among the wheat. There's a three-part series. Mystery, uh, uh, something Babylon. Um, but there's three videos. I can't think of all, all three of them right now. But they talk about this in there. In 1979, the year I was born, they came out with the philosophy that it is not the words that matter, but the message. And that's when, they started put, that's when they started putting out some Bible perversions, but that's when the Bible versions really shot through the roof. They had a few, and everyone wanted the King James Bible. They didn't want the Bible versions. They wanted nothing to do with it. Why? Because they were taught to fear God. And this is God's perfect written word. We don't add to it. We don't subtract from it. Then what came out? Well, we can't, we can't seem to get that King James Bible out of people's hands. Well, how do we do it? Well, we've got to change the philosophy of the... We've got to change the truth. It's not a philosophy. Sorry. We have to change the truth that God's Word is perfect and then have this philosophy that it's the message that matters, not necessarily the words. It's just the message. It's just the point you're trying to get across. In other words, the words do not define the message. And I told you, all they have to do is change the words, then the message changes. The words do not define the message, but the message defines the point 
that is meant to be given in the words. Well, you guys just don't understand the words. I know the Bible does say that, but you don't. You you are not. You're not interpreting it right. Yet the Bible says no scriptures of any private interpretation. But you're just not interpreting it right. You're not getting the real message. What God really wanted us to to to, to, to get. What he's really trying to say. You ever had that? No, tell me how you really feel when someone's being straightforward, they're telling the truth, they're telling you how they feel about you, and you're just sitting there and it just hits you so hard, you're like that, that joke about, no, tell me how you really feel, you know? Tell me what you really mean. They're trying to say, it's not God's words that matter. Let me tell you what he really means. No, 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 no. When the words of God and the message do not line up, where do you use God's word? I'm just going to throw that out there. Just smack across the face of a lot of those people. Oh, no, that try to defend the men that they follow. Even me, defend men that they follow. And when they're wrong, they're wrong. And they always come back, well, what's the message that matters? I'm going to slap you spiritually across the face. How dare you say that? It's the words that matter. Because when the message doesn't line up with the words, you're supposed to stand for God's word. Period. And you're becoming a respecter of persons, and you're letting God down. You're becoming that vessel that's to wood and earth. Because you're not following Jesus Christ. You're following some other man. They use good words and fair speeches. We see that in the Bible. By good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. And the simple, I'll keep saying it again and again until it just really drives home, brother, says Christ. What does it mean to be simple? Someone who doesn't know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. But you have people claiming they know God, but they go against this book. They don't know God. Right? They use good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. And what's the simple? Once again, they don't want people knowing the true word of God. That's why there's so many Bible perversions out there. That's why there's that mentality of, Yea, hath God said, it's, it's the message that matters. It's not the actual words, it's the message. These uh, good words and fair speeches to get the listener to get off the message. I'm saying, get on the message and forsake God's word. Whatever message is being preached, and oftentimes when you have people that go away from the Bible, that message is wrong, it's false. It'll have some truth in it. Remember how Satan works? Remember when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness? He spoke half truth, half lie. And because he snuck half lie in it, it all became a lie. And Jesus had to correct him. This is what the Word of God actually says. This is what the Word of God actually says. And when Jesus corrected him, God, the Father, manifests in the flesh, he didn't add to God's Word. He didn't subtract from God's Word. Satan did. That's that philosophy of the message is more important than the words of God. Yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be. I can improve on God's word. Okay, what are men doing? Some ignorantly based on the tradition of men. So I want to point this out there. Some of us, I was one of them, that you can be ignorant, brothers says Christ. You can be ignorant. You're adding to God's word ignorantly because that's how you were taught. In these, uh, I, I've been to a, a, bi, a Bible college for a year. Okay? They indoctrinate. They get you to think and start doing things contrary, the ways contrary to the Bible when it comes to how you read the Bible and study the Bible. You're to believe it as it is. But in these battle buildings, they work hard to desensitize you and saying that, yea, hath God said. No, we can use words that aren't in the Bible, and we can say things that aren't in the Bible. It's the message that matters. But what, how does God think, think of someone who tries to use the excuse ignorant? Oh, I was just, I did it ignorantly, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. I just did it ignorantly. But God will not leave you ignorant. Romans 1.13. Romans 1.13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Well, that, that, that was just that one instance. Romans 11.25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Oh, oh. Okay, this is just two instances. But there's times where God will leave someone ignorant, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 2 Corinthians 1, 8. 
For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you ignorant. 2 Peter 3.8 And I believe this is in the time of Jacob's trouble, but instruction righteous. God never wants anybody to be ignorant in any time, any dispensation in the Bible. But 2 Peter 3.8 But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Be not ignorant. I was taught to me, oh here it's 1 Corinthians 14, 38. Okay? I was taught, 1 Corinthians 14, 38 is where we're going to be going to next. Remember, you can pause the video and turn. I was taught, and this is a good teaching, that uh, I learned this. I, I'm going to be kicking Peter Ruckman. I'm going to be kicking me. I'm going to be kicking a lot of the men that taught me, my, what I call mentors, um, that taught me. Okay? But he, he, he said this once. He said, there was a, if there's a speed limit sign that says, let's say it says 45 miles per hour, and you go by at 65, and the cop pulls you over, and you say, well, I didn't see the sign. You're not getting in trouble because you, you're not getting a ticket because you didn't see the sign. You're getting a ticket because you could have seen the sign. It's right there, out in the open. P people today try to pretend, try to, they want to be ignorant. But you're not, they're not going to be judged because they didn't know. They're going to be judged because they could have known. This book is out there for anyone to see. Anybody can get a King James Bible to a point. We're still being able, there's some countries that's still kind of hard to get a King James Bible. Let, let's just use America. You get a King James Bible, easy. You can know the truth if you want the truth. If you want to know God and truly seek Him like we've been talking about, you're going to, you're going to do the Bible version issue study. A lot of these people that I talk to that won't let go of their Bible perversions, they refuse to do the Bible version issue study. Why? Because they want to be ignorant. Because they think they can use that as an excuse when they stand before Jesus Christ, which is God Almighty, at His throne, whether it's the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, they think they can stand before Him and claim ignorance. No, 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 no. 1 Corinthians 14, 38 says, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. They want to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. I'm here to preach the truth, brothers and Christ. If you love the truth too, you're there to try to share the truth with them. And if they don't want the truth, let them be ignorant. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. The reason I'm bringing this up, brothers, I want you to try to ease. So, Because some of you are going to feel like I'm just attacking you or anything. No, I'm trying to correct you and get you back on the right path the way someone corrected me and got me on the right path. Okay? And yes, you might be doing it ignorantly. You might be, it's a bad habit because you were taught wrong. You know, indoctrinated means that they tell you this is how it's done. And then the first, first time they tell you, you say that's not right. But by the thousandth time they've told you and they keep telling you over and over and over and over and over. And eventually you start saying, okay, that's the way it's supposed to be done. It's called indoctrination. They're trying to turn you from the right stance. And in all these colleges, not just Bible colleges, there's a lot of indoctrination going. Now the indoctrination, I found out, is going all the way down to grade school. They've been indoctrinating people starting in grade school. Brothers and Christ, they have children. Homeschool. Homeschool. I know it's getting hard out there because there's some laws in some states that are saying that you had to, your child has to go to public school. And then you have to really fight to get permission to homeschool. In the past, it was easy. If you wanted to homeschool, homeschool. But now that people are starting to catch on to the indoctrination that's going on, they're not ignorant, you know, the indoctrination that's going on, they're trying to take their kids out of public schools and home, uh, uh, home school, teach them at home, reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? And they're trying to attack them now and say, no, you can't, it's against the law, you can be arrested, your children take, I know we're in hard times, but by all means, get your children out of these the public systems that are based off indoctrination. Okay? But that's a good example. They're ignorant, but now they're not. But if any man be ignorant, let them be ignorant. If they refuse to do the Bible version issue study, that's on them. They're still going to have to answer for it. They think they can get away with it. No, they can't. Okay? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever they sow, that shall they also reap. Action. They could have sowed, studying the Bible version issue, coming to the King James Bible, getting it, believing it, hiding it in their heart and living it, sowing. 
Whatever they sow, that shall ye also reap. Their end is going to be according to their works. Yeah. God's not, not mocked. 2 Corinthians 4.2 2 Corinthians 4.2 but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Every man's conscience in the sight of God. Turn to 2 Peter 3.16. So you have men that handle the word of God deceitfully. Like I already saw one way is they'll say half-truths, they'll quote some things, and then they'll add. And they smash them together like it's all in the Bible when it's not. They're adding things in the Bible that's not in the Bible. But they add some things that are, so they can deceive the people saying, Oh yeah, I remember that verse that was in the Bible. But this other thing he's saying, I, I, it's, I guess it's in the Bible because the first part was in the Bible. He said this word, this word's in the Bible, but that word I can't remember if it's in the Bible. There's some people that if you did a test saying, Hey, can you show me where this word is in the Bible? They'll be like, Hey, it's in there, it's in there. I failed that test. I remember saying something once that a brother in Christ hit me up. I think it was a sister. I had a brother in Christ do it before. I had a sister in Christ do it before. And sister in Christ did it right. Praise God. She didn't come up here. How dare you? Usurping the authority of man. All she simply said was, is, that seemed great, but what you said right there, I I'm a little confused. Where's that at in the Bible? That's all she had to say to someone who loves the Word of God and, and trusts that this is perfect and this isn't. And I had a brother in Christ do it before. And I looked through and went, I couldn't find it. And I stop and go, well, where did I get that? I heard this man teach it and say it. I've heard that man teach it and say it. That, what is that? I've been indoctrinated into adding to God's Word. And I'm like, I had to correct, take the correction and say, okay, it's not in the God's Word. I need to say things God's way. And I need to stop saying things man's way. I need to start saying things God's way. He chose the way he said things, brothers and sisters of Christ, for a reason. He's smarter than us. He's God Almighty, okay? He knows what He's doing. But there's some that will purposely do that. They'll throw in some truth, because when they hear the truth, because they don't know the Word of God like they should know the Word of God, so when they hear that truth part, they think the lie part is also truth. When He's adding to the Word of God that that's also truth, because they remember John 3.16, they like to quote John 3.16. But you turn around and quote some of the other verses actually in the Pauline epistles, you know, oh, no, 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 that's, that, that's not in the Bible. And you show them to them. Because I've had people, I'll do it on the other side. I've had people correct me, brothers and sisters of Christ correct me, and I turn to the Bible and say, here it is. Well, that's not in the Bible. I turn to the Bible and say, here it is. I remember one, uh, I will praise that God elevates his word above his name. That's not true. That's not in the Bible whatsoever. You need to stop adding to God's word. And you turn to Psalms, I think it's in Psalms, where it says, I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And when I showed this to him, it's like you could, almost like you could hear cricket, cricket, cricket. And someone went, oh, that is in the Bible. I'm so sorry, that is in the Bible. The other people were like, you're still wrong, you're still wrong. That's how you know they're not Bible believers. You're still wrong, you're still wrong. Because they don't want this, they want this. They want man's intelligence. They want what they want. They don't want to actually take God's word and hide it here. Okay. But you have men who handle the word of God deceitfully. Um, well, we'll talk about another way here in a second. 2 Peter 3.16, another way people you handle the word of God deceitfully. First, they add to and subtract from God's word. So, so they'll take part of the truth and slap off half of it and put in a lie. So you have half truth, half lie, which makes the whole thing a lie. Because if it's not all true, it's all false. You need the whole truth. Now that first part that was truth, it needs the last part that's actually truth lined up in the Bible. It needs to all be, that's why everything needs to line up. Yea, if God said, is not something you want to be about. You want to be, thus saith the Lord. All that needs to be truth. 2 Peter 3.16 as also in the epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they, they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do others, also others, scriptures, unto their own destruction. They rest 
the scriptures to their own destruction. I've done that. I don't know if there's any men out there that's willing to admit this because they're just their pride and their ego. I've done that. Not publicly, but I've done that. I've got, I, I just talked about it. I've done a study before where I already had a preconceived idea saying this is absolute truth. It has to be absolute truth. Now let's see if we can make God's word back my absolute truth up. And I'm sitting there for hours. Sometimes it should have only taken like 20 minutes. But I'm sitting there for an hour or two hours wrestling the scriptures because I want it to say what I want it to say. And after two hours, guess what happens? I've got to sub submit myself to this book. That topic, what I wanted the Bible to prove and back up, it was wrong. It was wrong. But there's some men that are so prideful that they'll go ahead and rest the scriptures and put it into a study knowing that the Bible doesn't back up what they're saying. And they'll put it out in a study. And what are they doing? They're resting the scriptures to their own destruction. And they're deceiving. They're being deceived and deceiving people. Okay, be careful of those people. Okay. I've done it when I've tried to do some studies. I, I think this is something great. I think that's something great. A good example of this is um, Sam Gipp. I know people are going to get upset, but Sam Gipp, he put out a study saying that, um, try to remember the names, my brain freezes sometimes. Forgive me, brothers, says Christ, on names. But Joseph and Mary... Okay, that they should, when they had the baby, that's God manifest in the flesh, not they, Mary had the baby, that they were, they were both supposed to name the baby Jesus. And there's two verses that specifically say they were commanded. One was by God manifest in the flesh, the angel of the Lord, in a dream in Joseph. It's Jesus. But in a dream to Joseph, that's why he could be in, it's a dream, that's why he could be in Joseph's dream. And he's in the stomach of Mary. People say he was in two places at once. No, he wasn't. He was in a dream. It was a dream. He was still only in one place. But it was a dream. And he was told and commanded, Joseph was commanded, to name the child Jesus. Mary was commanded to name the child Jesus. Sam Gipp left those two verses out. He was wrestling the scriptures, wrestling the scriptures, saying, hey, they should have named the child. He started out with this premise. They should have named the child uh, Emmanuel. And they were in sin. For, they were wrong for not naming the child Emmanuel. And that's the preconceived idea he came in with. And he kept wrestling the scriptures, wrestling the scriptures, wrestling the scriptures, trying to make it prove what he wanted it to prove. And did he, drop, did he come to the conclusion like he should have? I'm wrong. I need to drop it. I need to start studying something else because this is wrong. They were commanded. He even came across those verses. They were commanded. So what did he do? He cut those two verses out and came out with the study anyway to his own destruction. A lot of people looked at him and said, wait a second. That's not true. You just lied. And you know the people that defended him? You know what their, their, what their number one defense was? On all of, I read the, the comments. This was years, a few years ago. I read the comments and everything, and it's like, you know what their number one defense of this of, of Sam Gibb? And I believe Sam Gibb's saved, but he's indoctrinated. Okay, he's indoctrinated, and we're going to find out. He's indoctrinated and diseased with, yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be. But the thing is, their number one way of defending the man was, it was the message that mattered. Not the words of God, just the message. It's the point. You're missing the point he was trying to get across. His point was that he should have been named Emmanuel when he already had that title. But he was supposed to be named Emmanuel. That was his point. And he was wrong, 100%. Now, he might have come out down the road. I don't know. He might have come out and, and repented. I'm just using it as an example, okay, of someone who wrestles the Scriptures to their own destruction. Another example, I used this on a brother in Christ recently, that his wife has turned him against the Word of God when it comes to the order of authority, and his wife is the one that wants to really be in charge, but she tries to act so innocent behind the scenes. But she's the one that really wants to be in charge. And he goes through and he's wrestling the Scriptures to his own destruction because that's what she did. And that's what she taught him. And this brother in Christ said, before we got into it, he said, before he got married, he believed as I do. Well, no, I believe what the Bible says. See how he changed it? It's more like, that's just what you believe versus what you believe versus what this person... No, it's what the Bible says. There's an order of authority. 
And every scripture he tried to wrestle to his own destruction, and he's being destroyed because he won't submit to the word of God. And I love that brother in Christ. But he'll take and try to twist everything around. He'll add to, he'll subtract. I said, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. Here's what the Bible actually says. Let's compare Scripture with Scripture. And he doesn't want to do that anymore. He did for a lot of the studies we did. We did a lot of studies together. But then when we get to this one point, he doesn't want to do that anymore. Brian Denlinger did a lot of the studies. Chapter and verse, comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Then we get to the whole subject of Christmas, and he throws all that out, and he just wants to wrestle the Scriptures to his own destruction. And he's destroying himself. Turning his back on the imminent, or looking for that blessed hope, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He's destroying himself. He's wrestling the scriptures to his own destruction. I've been corrected, brothers and Christ. I have been wrong. I have. But this is the two things I see going on. This whole sickness of, yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be, we can prove on the word of God. You have people that are handing the word of God deceitfully, and you have brethren that are wrestling the scriptures to their own destruction. Because they want something that the Bible doesn't teach. They want to live in a way that the Bible says you're not supposed to do that. And they're going to keep wrestling and wrestling the scriptures to their own destruction. Now, I want to point out this too. We use all kinds of words today not found in the Word of God. Microwave, airplane, you know, people say, oh yeah. They'll try to use that excuse. Please be careful, brethren. Don't fall for that excuse that excuse, because it's just an excuse. And it's not even a good one. Why do you add to God's word? Oh, because we use all kinds of words that are in the Bible. Oh yeah, we use all kinds of words in the Bible. But when I say airplane, or I say microwave, or refrigerator, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord. We always use words. Don't fall for that deception. Well, we always use words. This isn't the Bible, that is the Bible. We all what they're doing is they're taking words and inserting them into the Bible saying, Thus saith the Lord, and the words aren't there. That's the difference. Don't fall for that. But the deception is when they say that the word being used are in God's words. It's there. It's basically there. You, if you can't see it, it's on you. You hear that a lot with the Trinity. It's basically it's there. Why can't you see it? It's there. They're so hard-hearted. Conscience seared with a hot iron indoctrinated, that it's basically that we're, all we're saying is this chapter and verse where it actually says it. Chapter and verse. Well, if you can't see it, that's on you. And then they'll misquote the verse, they that are of God, it's hear God's words. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. And all we said was chapter and verse where it actually says it. And they couldn't show us. Fundamentals of the faith. Well, yeah, these are fundamentals of the faith. How many times have you heard that? This is a fundamental of the faith. Trinity. It's a fundamental of the faith. Well, if it's a fundamental of the faith, you're saying that thus saith the Lord, chapter and verse where God says Trinity. As a title or a description. Well, that's just you, man. That's just you. No. You claim, when you say it's a fundamental of the faith, when you say, when you're doing a teaching saying this is absolute truth, no, this is absolute truth. So what you're saying, if it's absolute truth, it better be in here. If it's not, you need to change how you're saying things or give up what you're saying. It's that simple. But today, in these last days, with the falling away, it doesn't seem to be that simple. Everyone just seems to hold hardcore, and it's, that's the number one thing causing division. Moses Christ. That's the number one thing causing division in the body of Christ today. You have people fighting and arguing over things that aren't even in the scriptures. Have you noticed that? How many of you actually noticed that? Raise your hands. <laughs> I wish I had a box. I'm tired of talking to a camera, but raise your hands. How many of you have, have noticed that? That a lot of the arguments and the division that's going on, and I'm talking about the body of Christ, Bible believers, people professing to be King James, Bible believing, God fearing men and women, the. the separation and division that's going on, it's primarily caused by people fighting and arguing over words and terms and titles and descriptions that aren't in the scriptures. Have you noticed that? I have. Some do it purposely. Romans 16, 13, Romans 16, 
Verse thir uh, 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are... For for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. While others do it ignorantly, being spoiled. Colossians 2 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Some are doing it intentionally, they're servants of Satan. Some do it ignorantly because they've been spoiled. I use the word indoctrination, but the Bible word, it's a good word to use, is they're spoiled. You ever heard that saying, the spoiled little brat? Some of those men in ministry are spoiled little brats. They're spoiled. They're hard-hearted. They won't give up their, what the world says for what God says. Doing things the world's way for doing things God's way. They won't do it. Mm -hmm. But like we discussed, God will not leave you ignorant. If you're truly saved and born again, God's going to show you the truth. They just reject it. You come across, I don't know of one person that, that hasn't been told about the Bible version issue when it comes to the lost world. I don't, there's some that they're still trying to hide it, but they can know. I, could, I start trying to tell some of my neighbors that are in the easy believism and using Bible perversions, these Bible buildings, and I try to talk to them about the Bible version issue, and they shut me down real quick. Why? Because they want to be ignorant. But God will not leave you ignorant. If you're truly seeking truth, God will show you the truth. God will show you the truth. Now, Genesis 3.1, we're going to get into this test real quick. The test. I know this took a while, but I wanted to really get into it to really get your mindset into this is the truth. And there's a war going on out there, brothers and sisters. There's a war out there fighting. We all know this. There's a war out there fighting for this truth. The King James Bible is God's perfect written word. But do you know the one place where the war is being neglected? Here. There's a war out there about God's truth, but there's also a war here in the body of Christ when it comes to God's truth. There isn't a disease that's spreading through the body of Christ that's attacking that we have brethren that I love and I know that are saved. I'm one of them. I'm not saying I love myself, that you love me, but I'm one of the brothers of Christ. I'm trying to lump myself in with everybody. We've all made these mistakes. We've all been guilty of having this disease of, yea, hath God said. Okay. And we forget that the war is here first, then out there. It starts here, brother says Christ, but a lot of us are neglecting here to be focused on there. And I know men in ministry that are neglecting this and focusing on out there, and this is falling apart. You know who you are, because okay? you're too busy fighting out there that you're not fighting the war that's here. You're letting things in because you're not being sober and being vigilant when it comes to your personal walk with the Lord. You're too busy being sober and vigilant about everyone else's walk and what's going on in the world. Okay? So I did this for me. Genesis 3.1 started out with me talking to the Lord about me. Now I'm sharing it with you. Genesis 3.1. So everything we just went through, I hit myself up with first. All my studies, I walked for a week or so, talking with the Lord about them, saying, hey, is there anything I'm leaving out? Is there anything I'm missing? Is there, am I lining up with this? Am I failing you in this, Lord? Before I try to exhort the brethren, Lord, can you exhort me and encourage me? Do I line up with what we're talking about? Right. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made, and hath said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Yea, hath God said. A better rendering would be. I want to throw that part in there. Not, I'm not adding to God's word. That's, yea, hath God said, says you're questioning what God says. And today one of the biggest things that people are falling in the trap of is a better rendering would be. Oh well, yeah, God was right in what he said, but I can improve on it. All right. So you guys ready for the test? Here's the test to see if you have the yea hath God said disease. Let me ask you, how many of you guys believe in the Trinity? I know we already talked about this. How many believe that there was a time where I believed in the Trinity? I actually believed in the Godhead, but I was using Trinity. All right. God in three persons. That was me at one time. How many of you believe in God and three persons? Okay. Uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
I was guilty. I was guilty. I'm going to throw it out there. I was guilty. How many use the word church age? They believe in the church age. I know some of you are like, wait, wait, wait. wait. Church age. Just go with me on this and be honest. I did. The Great Tribulation for that 70 year time period. It's the title of the Great Tribulation. How many of you have heard so many people say the church age? They keep saying the Great Tribulation. I did. A uh, rapture. Are you looking forward to the rapture? How many here are looking forward to the rapture? How many believe in the rapture? Raise your hand. I did. Now I don't. <laughs> and before you get mad, I believe in the catching away of the body of Christ. Being caught up. Like I said, we'll go through all these. Every one of these, we're going to hit videos, and we're going to show what Bible, the Word of God actually says versus what these say, and we're going to show which one's right. All right? And why God said the, said it the way He said it. But let's stick with this test real quick. How many believe in the rapture? I did it one time. I used the word rapture. I believe in the rapture. How many believe in the millennial kingdom? Millennial kingdom. Some of you are like, oh, come on now. Millennial kingdom. I've said it a lot. I try not to anymore. We'll, we'll show why in future studies. How many believe in Nephilim? I was reading a study about angels. Someone was asking Peter Ruckman a question on angels. And in the comment section, well, the Nephilim this and Nephilim that. How many believe in Nephilim? Raise your hands. Half angel, if you don't know what that word means, it means half angel, half men. Okay? It's in video games. Okay? Remember, I used to be a video game addict. Angels with wings. How many believe angels have wings? Now, the thing that always got me with Peter Ruckman is he always drew angels with wings, and then he'd correct it verbally, but his actions didn't line up with his words. They both need to line up, brothers of Christ. He would draw them with wings, but then he would say they don't have wings. What was he doing? He was pleasing both crowds. Did you notice that? I'm just throwing that in real quick. Did you notice that? I just It frustrates me because he deceives the hearts of the simple, and that's what I'm talking about. Be careful. He added truth with lies. He would preach the truth that uh, angels don't have wings, but then he would draw angels with wings. He was pleasing both crowds. If people wanted angels with wings, he gave it to them. If people had a problem with angels with wings, he would verbally correct it, saying, hey, angels don't have wings, to please them. He was trying to please both crowds. He wasn't trying to please God, period. And you can get mad all you want, but once again, I said, please, get that respecter of persons and throw it out. And stick with what we're saying about the Word of God. How many of you believe angels have wings? I did for a while when I was lost. And I, shortly after I was saved, I believed for a while. But then I got corrected really quick, thank God, by a brother in Christ. Holiday. Okay, you have Christmas, uh, Good Friday, Risen Sunday. They try to place Easter with Risen Sunday, Risen Sunday, Easter, you know. And, you know, but there's this teaching that holiday and holy day are the same thing. Okay, and a lot of people are saying you're trying to tell, you're talking about Brian Denley. Brian Denley is one of them, but he's not the only one. But he tries to say holiday and holy day are the same thing. Okay, how many believe holidays is biblical? Holiday is biblical. I know a lot of people will say that no better will say no, but I, threw, I wanted to throw this in there because that's serious. When you say holiday and holy day, you do the Bible definition of holy day, what a holy day is in the scripture. Is, is Easter a holy day? Take out the word holiday and, and use the word holy day. They won't do that. Because they know a lot of those holidays are sinful and wicked and satanic. They're not holy days. So there's a difference between a holiday and a holy day. But anyway, holy day. How many believe in holy days? Or holidays, I'm sorry, holy days, yes. Holidays. Oh, I believe in holidays. If holidays are biblical. Holidays are scriptural. Okay. How about this one? Flat earth. I know this is going to get some people. I'm not going to do a huge study on it again. Once again, this fact, I probably won't even do videos on it because I already said I wouldn't. I already gave a video saying what I'm going to say right here once we get into it. But flat earth. How many people believe in a flat earth? How many people believe in a globe earth? A globe earth. A round earth. Globe earth. Raise your hands. I probably could have kept going, but I stopped right there. I put ETC, etc. But globe earth. Guess what? If you said yes and you raised your hand to any one of these things, you, or all, most of them, me at one point, almost all of them, 
except for the flat earth and globe earth, but almost all of them. You have been infected with the disease of Yeath God said. If you said yes to any of these, then you have the Yeath God said disease. People will use these words, then explain what the Bible says sometimes. Like we said with Trinity, they'll grab Godhead verses and say, see, that's the Trinity. They just sneak Trinity in there. Does the Bible actually say Trinity? No, it doesn't. Okay. So they'll read what the Bible says to explain the words that they're adding to the Bible instead of just sticking with the words that the Bible actually said. But the word itself is not in the Holy Scriptures, and the true meaning of these words are being left out. They're not giving you the true definition. They're giving you the Bible definition of the word that they replaced with their word and say, see, it's in the Bible. Trinity is the best way I can say it. There's, there's definitions of what the Godhead is, and they took the word Godhead, knocked it clean out, and put in the word Trinity, and they stole the definition of Godhead from the word Godhead, the title Godhead, and they gave it to Trinity. But that's not the real definition of Trinity. And they won't tell you the real definition of Trinity. They won't tell you the real definition of these words. Why they say what they're saying. What's motivating them to use these words instead of God's words. They won't tell you. And yet, but I want to point this out. To true meaning, words are being left out. The true means, they don't want you to know the real meaning behind these words. Yet people will break fellowship, call one another lost, or heretic, and die a thousand deaths to stand for a word or words that are not even in the Holy Scripture. Have you noticed that, brothers and sisters Christ? And the words they're using have a different meaning than the words that the Bible actually does say, and people are breaking fellowship over this. That's all Satan's plan. He's, he's indoctrinating people with the yea that God said a better rendering would be. And I'm not going to leave you like just ignorant, brothers and sisters Christ. Let's go through those same words again. But I'm going to just, I'm just going to say what God said, just to say, hey, this should be enough to get you to get those words out of your vocabulary when it comes to saying, yea, hath God said. When you say, this is absolute truth, this is major doctrine, this is fundamentals of the faith, you need to get these words out of your vocabulary and use the words that God chose. Trinity. God never said Trinity. God's not a Trinity. God the Father is the one true God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. There's only but one capital G, God the Father. And God the Father is in Jesus Christ. I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. If you don't believe me, believe, it the, for, believe me for the work's sake. Before Abraham was, I am. No man can take him out of my hand. No man can take him out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Body and soul are connected. They are one. Jesus is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. He is God, the Father. But they take that out. But Trinity is not in the Bible. So what did the Bible actually say? Godhead. Why is that so hard for people to stick with the word Godhead? Because Trinity is actually, we'll get into it again, but the true meanings behind these. I'm just going to replace, show you the words that God chose. Okay. Now the Bible teaches that God is God in the person of Jesus Christ. But people like to say God in three persons. But the Bible actually teaches there's only one person in the Godhead, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called a person four times in the Bible. God the Father is never called a person. The Holy Spirit is never called a person. The Spirit of God is never called a person. Only Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, is the Godhead. Only in Him is the manifestation of the Godhead bodily. He's the whole Godhead in one. You have to be Jesus Christ. I mean, it's Jesus Christ that is a person of the Godhead. But that's what the Bible teaches. It actually uses the word person for Jesus Christ. But it never uses the person for God, the Father. It never uses person for the Holy Spirit. Be careful, because some will try to use good words and fair speeches. Oh, but it says he or she. and the... It says that for animals. It says that for wisdom, you know, for traits. Just because it needs to actually say person. And that's what you need to hit them up with. Where does it say God the Father is a person? And where does it say the Holy Spirit is a person? It has to say both are persons for it to be God in three persons. Because I remember there's a fourth verse that they try to steal from Jesus Christ being called a person, and they try to give it to God the Father, but they admit nowhere in Scripture does it say the Holy Spirit is a person. Nowhere. So that still proves saying God in three persons is wrong. 
It's wrong. But the Bible says it's God and the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one called a person in the Bible. Jesus called the Son of God. Not God the Son. Son of God. So why are they changing him? We've done studies on this. But we'll do it again because we've got to keep it fresh in our hearts. He's called Son of God, Only Begotten Son. You know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Son of God, begotten Son, born of, derived from, God manifests in the flesh. Okay? That's what the Bible says. Not God the Son. God the Son is nowhere in the Scriptures. God is, or it says, God the Spirit. No, the Bible doesn't say that. It says God is a spirit, spirit of God. Spirit of God, God is a spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. It shows connection. That's what the of is. They take away the connection and make him a separate God. We've proven this. I just don't want to leave you without knowing the real words on this study. But we're going to go through each one of these, these things, these subjects and these words, and we're going to show what God says and why they changed it. Because their, their intentions is to go against the Word of God. Ignorantly or willingly. Remember that? Ignorantly or willingly. You might be doing it ignorantly. I said these things ignorantly. But when you actually do the study, it didn't take long for me to go, I'm going to say things God's way. I'm getting these things out. I'm still, you can still say them, but I'm no longer saying, thus saith the Lord. I'm not saying this is doctrine. I'm not saying it's in the Bible anymore. I'm not saying that you're lost if you don't believe something that's not in the Scriptures. I'm not dividing over things that aren't in the Scripture. I'm divide. I'm... I'm losing fellowship with brethren because I'm standing for what the Bible actually says. And they're not. Okay, here's the one people say, church age. Well, what's wrong with that? It's, it's, church age is nowhere in the scriptures. You know what the Bible actually calls this time period from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ? He calls the time period the time of Jacob's, uh, the time of the Gentiles. I almost jumped ahead a little bit. The time of the Gentiles. So only Gentiles can get saved. No. Like I said, we'll do scripture to back a lot of this stuff up. But no, what it's saying is that salvation, when Jesus was here preaching the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is only for the Jews. That's a gospel that John the Baptist started preaching, that Jesus took it up and started preaching it, that he, that you had to repent and believe that he is the, the son of the living God. For thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. When he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They had to do water baptism to cleanse themselves, like washing themselves on the outside, and, be, and, and believe that their king is here. But that, that gospel of salvation was just for the Jewish people. And after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, salvation went out to the world. That's why it's called the time of the Gentiles. Not because only Gentiles can get saved, but because before the time of the Gentiles, salvation was only of the Jews. Jesus said it himself. For salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. He sent out his apostles and said, don't go in the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans, which I believe are Jews that lost the inheritance, but only to the house of Israel. Why is it called the time of the Gentiles? Because salvation went out to the world. Anybody can get saved now. That's why it's called that. But that's what the Bible calls it. How many of you have ever heard it called that? I never did until God showed it to me. I've always said church age. But that's not in the Bible. Uh, the Great Tribulation. What does the Bible actually say? It calls it the time, of Dan the time of Jacob's trouble. That's one title for it. Daniel's 70th week is the other title. 70th week. Every week represents seven years. And that 70th week hasn't happened yet. So it's called Daniel's 70th week and the time of Jacob's trouble. It's never called the Great Tribulation. Never. And those days there shall be Great Tribulation. It's a description. But it was never, that time period is not called the Great Tribulation. But I can get ahead of myself a little bit and tell you why they call it the Great Tribulation. Is they take out the fact that, it's a, that God goes back to dealing with the Jewish people. That the time of Jacob's trouble is primarily about God turning back to the Jews and getting things set up for his thousand year reign. He goes back to preaching the kingdom of heaven along with the kingdom of God. That spiritual kingdom that we have today gets the kingdom of heaven comes back. They've got to be preaching both. Works and faith in the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's oh, for about the Jews. It's not about the body of Christ. The bride of Christ. We're not here. But how do you get, make it, how do you deceive people into believing that we're here? You take those away and you say, 
the Great Tribulation. You change what the Bible says so you can preach a message that you want to preach. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. Now, I've heard brethren say that, but they predominantly say the, the Great Tribulation. That's not in there. Um, rapture. People thought, we've done study on this, we'll do it again. Blessed hope, day of Christ. Those are two things that, that, that when we get caught up, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, I call it the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away of the body of Christ, but it's actually called the blessed hope, the day of Christ. That's what the Bible calls it. Okay? It's not called rapture. Okay? Catching away, the Bible says we will be caught up. Okay? So caught, catching is plural of caught up. There's nothing wrong with saying that, okay? Because the Bible actually says caught up. But the actual, with that event, that event has a name. The Blessed Hope and the Day of Christ. Now, Millennial Kingdom, Millennial Kingdom, we talked about this a little bit already. Kingdom of Heaven is what the Bible says. The Day of the Lord. Kingdom of Heaven, Day of the Lord. And if you look at the Bible, and we go through it to do it more in depth, it includes the, t the transition of the time of Jacob's trouble going into the thousand year reign and when Satan's let loose. So it's more than just a thousand years. But if you, make, if you say millennial kingdom, you limit everything to that thousand years and you mess things up in the Bible. Because Jesus and his parables, because then we can grab Jesus' parables and say that's for us today. It's not. A lot of his parables were for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble transitioning into the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And at the end, when Satan's let loose, when that enemy goes around and starts sowing tares among the weeds, they try to say, that's for today. That, I understand that the, uh, we can use it for instruction in righteousness today. But the point is, is those parables are for the, for the Jews in that, that time period, those three different time periods. We can learn from it. We can get instruction in righteousness from it. But it's never called the Millennial Kingdom. And when you say Millennial Kingdom and you replace Kingdom of Heaven, Day of the Lord, with Millennial Kingdom, you take away from the Word of God. But we'll get into that in more depth. But the Bible says Kingdom of Heaven, Day of the Lord. It's never called the Millennial Kingdom. Um, fallen Angels. I'm, I was doing this study looking into it. Fallen Angels. The uh, Bible doesn't ever actually say Fallen Angels. Mm-hmm. just doesn't. Now, there's mighty men of renown when it talks about... Let's see if I'm getting ahead of myself. I skipped. Forgive me. After Millennial Kingdom was Nephilim. Nephilim. The Bible doesn't say Nephilim. A lot of you probably said, yeah, I knew that, but it doesn't say Nephilim. It says mighty men of renown. There was men that were born. And people try to mistake in the giants as being Nephilim. They're not. There were already giants in those days before the angels left their first estate, came down, took wives of men, and had these mighty men, gave birth to these mighty men. There were already giants. I think before the flood there was giants. There was some giants after the flood for a little while, but like the age of people went down, giants slowly got phased out. They disappeared. Okay. People used to live to be 900 years. Now they don't. There used to be giants before the flood. After the flood, they still lived to be like 400, 300 years. But over time, they got the Bible says they got down to 120 years. Then another event happened later on down the road, and I got corrected by a brother in Christ, that today now we're down to 70 to 80 years is the lifespan that God has set for mankind, not 120. But the point is, is it doesn't say Nephilim. It says, the Bible actually says, mighty men of renown. That's what they're called. You say, well, it's not that big of a deal. It is. When you start taking the way God says things and start replacing it with the way man says things, that's a bad habit to have, and it's going to get you messed up every time. Every time. Angels with wings. The Bible teaches angels look like men. Okay? Fallen angels. Okay? The Bible never says fallen angel. How many of you guys have heard that fallen angels... The Bible never once calls those angels, uh, before the flood, fallen angels. They never called the angels that Satan draws with the, a third of the stars with his tails. It never calls those angels fallen angels. You know what it calls the first set of angels? It says the angels that left their first estate. And you know what I believe about the angels in the Revelation? 
Satan, when he gets kicked out, they say, hey, we're following Satan. So if, when Satan gets kicked out, they come down Jacob's ladder, and they come down, and they leave their first estate, and they come down here, and they leave their first estate. And the Bible talks about in Daniel how in the Old Testament, they cleaved to women, and they had children, but in the Revelation, they won't cleave to, to women. They won't be having children like they did before the flood. But they'll be down here. They're not here now, but they will be. Okay. Angels that left their first estate. That's what the Bible calls them. Okay. Holiday. Bible doesn't say holiday. Bible says holy day. We talked about this. Holy day. Why is it called a holy day? Because it's God ordained, God commanded, God tells you how to keep it, when to keep it, why to keep it, and there's oftentimes consequences for not keeping it. It's a holy day. But it, ultimately, it pleases God. God ordains it. It pleases Him. And why were we created? To please God. There is no holiday in the Bible. Only holy day. And the reason they try to mix holiday and holy day together is so they can sneak in certain days that are satanic and wicked. Right? Uh, flat earth, globe earth. The Bible says earth, planet, world. It never says flat earth. It never says globe earth. Yet people are fighting back and forth like little children okay, that are ignorant 